Good evening and welcome to tonight's live online author event with Greenlight Bookstore. I'm Kay from Greenlight and we're thrilled to host tonight's event with Nelson Simone launching his new book, Soul of the Hurricane, The Perfect Storm and an Accidental Sailor. He will be talking with Amy Eddings, so you're in for an excellent time. Before we start, I just want to say a huge thanks to Nelson, Amy, and the team at Chicago Review Press for making this happen, and to all of you for showing up. Although we're not able to host events in our store spaces, our community of authors and readers is still here. We're grateful for your support and for the chance to make space for conversation and connection. Now, just a couple of housekeeping things. In our Zoom webinar tonight, you can see and hear the speakers, but they can't see or hear you. They can see that you're here though, and there are a couple of different ways you can interact with the authors and with each other throughout tonight's event, which we highly encourage. The first is the chat, which you can find by clicking on the icon that looks like one speech balloon. You're welcome to post your comments and thoughts in the chat, it's a great way to show your appreciation for the author and interact with fellow attendees. If you have a specific question you'd like to have answered by the author, please post that question in the Q&A module. You can find it by clicking on the icon that looks like two speech balloons. We'll be pulling questions only from the Q&A to be answered in the later part of the program. And importantly, tonight's featured book, Soul of the Hurricane, is available for sale from Greenlight Bookstore. You can shop in person from 10 a.m. to 7 p.m. at both our Fulton Street and Flatbush Ave stores, where you can purchase Nelson's book and many others on site. You can also order online at greenlightbookstore.com for a quick pickup at the store or for shipping anywhere in the U.S. I'll drop the buy link in the chat. Lastly, Nelson will be stopping by our stores to sign copies of the book, so you can get a signed or even personalized book by request while supplies last. Make sure to indicate your signed copy request in order comments at checkout when ordering online by midnight tonight, or look for signed copies when you visit the store. If you care about supporting the careers of authors and the ongoing existence of independent bookstores, Buying tonight's featured book is a great way to show your support. Our interviewer tonight is Amy Eddings, a writer, journalist, and host of NPR's Morning Edition on WCPN, IdeaStream Public Media in Cleveland, Ohio. A native of suburban Cleveland, Amy spent 28 years in New York City, where she was host of NPR's All Things Considered, at WNYC for 10 years. She was also a reporter for six years at WNYC. She is the recipient of numerous awards for radio and investigative reporting. And you'll be speaking with our featured author, Nelson Simone. Nelson Simone is a writer and performer. Originally from La Paz, Bolivia, he was a longtime collaborator with the choreographer, Susan Hefner, and the composer percussionist Michael Evans, with whom he created performances and videos that explored the human situation with wit, irony, and lots of pratfalls. In 2006, Simone led a team of interviewers and facilitators from StoryCorps, the National Oral History Project, to New Orleans to chronicle the life of the city in the aftermath of Hurricane Katrina. In 2016, he created The Accidental Sailor, the storytelling performance on which Song of the Hurricane is based. He lives in Brooklyn. Nelson's new book, Song of the Hurricane, tells an unlikely tale that begins with an unexpected invitation and ends in the dead of night somewhere far from home with a Coast Guard helicopter above and a dark, angry sea below. It has been hailed in the media as a remarkable debut from a singular storyteller and a thundering memoir of extraordinary grace and character. Nelson is going to start us off with a reading from the book, and then he'll be talking with Amy and with all of you. Please take it away, Nelson. All right, thank you. 
So a little setup um, for this excerpt. I've been to a, a presentation at uh, the National History Museum with friends. And when we were there, we've been invited to sail a 126 year old Norwegian schooner from Brooklyn to Bermuda. My two friends jumped at the chance and uh, I couldn't figure out any way to say no. So now I'm stuck. And uh, this picks it up on the next day when we sail, when we head over to uh, the boat yard. The next day, Thursday, October 24th, 1991, Peter, Mike, and I made our way to Mill Basin, where the ship was in dry dock amid the final preparations for the journey. Peter saw Anna Christina first at the far end of the yard. She was out of the water and the scaffolding looked like two huge hands holding her up like an offering. This would be Anna Christina's first trip without Norman at the helm. Busy with lectures and other commitments, he had hired a young sailor, Joey Gelband, to get her from Brooklyn to Bermuda. Norman would join the ship there to continue, continue the trip to the Caribbean. As we stood on the dock, Joey approached us. He had some bad news. We're eight, he said. I need nine. I can only take one of you. I'll take the most experienced. I bit my lip, trying to figure out what expression I should have on my face. Surprised, quizzical, expectant? Who knew? Inside, I was dancing a jig because I knew that while Peter was a landlubber like me, except for those few outings with the bakers, Mike had been sailing his whole life. Sunnies, day sailors, dinghies, all kinds of small craft. I shrugged in what I hoped looked like disappointment. I've only had a week on the clear water. Joey scratched his beard stubble. Well, he said, the clear water has the same kind of rigging as Anna Christina. It's only a week, but you've still got more experience on a tall ship than these other two. And so I would go. Now time seemed to speed up as I, pulled for, as I was pulled, for, pulled forward in the wake of my predicament. Two hours later, I was on an Amtrak train to DC. I needed my passport, which was at my parents' house in Maryland. My parents were away and my sister Fatima, 15 years younger than me, was still at school. But my grandmother was home. Now, normally my grandmother was not one to be trifled with, but I was a man on a mission. I rang the doorbell. She opened the door, surprised to see me. She said, what are you doing here? Get out of my way, Abuela, I said. I need my passport, as if that were all the explanation she needed. By this time, I was on automatic because I could not allow myself to feel anything, much, much less think about the situation I had gotten myself into. I had to do this. I was going to do this. And if I let myself for a moment stop and think, it might be too much to bear. I got the passport, caught the next train back to New York, and spent a sleepless night in Brooklyn. As I lay there, I thought back to meeting Norman for the first time. I had been in the museum lobby after the presentation, and Mary Ann had appeared at my shoulder with Norman in tow. He smiled warmly and shook my hand, told me how lucky they were to have someone with my experience aboard. Mary Ann informed Norman that no, I was not that Nelson, but I had volunteered for the trip. He let go of my hand and seemed to search for something to say, finally mumbled something I could not understand, then turned and walked away. I stood there with Mary Ann, a, sm a thin smile frozen on my lips. Oh God, I thought. The next morning I packed a small bag and made my way back to Mill Basin. Thank you, Nelson. I love that passage. It's just like the tractor beam pulling you in. Um, thank you, everybody. Uh, just a quick acknowledgement of how international our audience is. I saw folks from Japan, Sydney, Australia in the house, Singapore, 
Uh, my brother in San Mateo is here. My sister from Ada is here, which is wonderful. Thanks, family. North Carolina, um, Brooklyn, of course. So great to have you here. Um, I'm really, really happy to be here. And I know Nelson is too. So yeah. I wanted to start off, Nelson. Today, October 28th, is the 20th anniversary of your helicopter rescue from the Anna Christina. The 30th anniversary, you're right. Thir 30th. 30, 1991. Oh yep. my goodness, I did the math wrong. 30th mm -hmm. anniversary. Does this date bring on complex emotions for you? Um, you know, I really don't think about it on a regular basis. Um, but I, I have to say that well, to be honest, Halloween has always brought on complicated emotions. <laughs> <laughs> okay. That was a complicated time on the ship. That's a whole other memoir. That's a whole other thing. Yeah. yeah. You were part of a crew of nine. Uh, the Captain Joey Geldband, whom you mentioned, his friend Damian Sailors, Peter Abelman, uh, Marty Hanks, Langdon Schmidt, John Nusiforo, Barbara Trays, the ship's cook, and first mate Jen Irving. Tell us what you were doing around this time 30 years ago. I think from what I could tell from the book, the US Coast Guard was trying to drop dewatering pumps near the ship. Where were you? Well, uh, let's see. At a certain point, as things were getting worse and worse, the, the, the experience on, on the ship, obviously I was the least experienced. Um, there were others that were also not, not as experienced. So Joey decided as the weather got heavier that the most experienced uh, sailors would be on deck and the rest of us would be below deck. And so for most of, I was on deck for a good part of the beginning of the storm. And then I was below deck for, for the rest of it. Um, and I think the, the most vivid experience I have at that time below deck is one of us was, uh, I had been uh, really, really seasick, really seasick right before the storm hit. And once the storm hit, I just came out of it, you know, but another one of us was really sick. He was in his bunk and uh, we feared for him because he couldn't walk anymore. He was so debilitated. And Joy was, was everywhere trying to keep people busy, trying to keep our spirits up. And um, so he figured out that uh, um, we could rig a pump from the head, the bathroom, down into the bilge and literally hand pump, you know? So he got me to go and hand pump with this guy. Um, we were probably pumping nothing, next to nothing, uh, but it gave us something to do. And I realized at a certain point that, um, that uh, if we sang songs, if we sang, then that would keep our spirits up. So I knew Dylan's songs the best of all. Bob Dylan was a hero of mine. So I started singing Dylan and, and Langdon, the two of us just sang the whole time as we pumped. You, um, right of the moment when you came on deck to start the rescue process, uh, which by the way, would involve climbing onto the ship's rail and jumping into the sea in like 75 mile per hour winds, uh, and 30 foot waves, not an easy task. <laughs> you, you write, it looked like some bizarre site specific performance piece. What did you mean by that? I think that, that a lot of it has to do with the elasticity of time, that at different points, it is that thing where things slow way down. And I had been below deck for hours and hours and hours. And uh, when I finally came on deck, the helicopter was hovering above us with this one, uh, you know, it was 12 midnight, one in the morning. So they had their, the, the one spotlight bathing the, the deck in light. And it felt like things had just, you know, I'm sure this wasn't the truth, but the way I remembered it was that it was completely silent. There was just an ominous silence to it. And the, and the light was bathing all of us. And it just felt like, a performance it felt unreal to me you know yeah 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 you mentioned the stillness and you also felt um, a great sense of peace when you jumped into the water yes yeah um, uh, right. well let me tell you first before that the reason we had because people said why did you jump is because uh we had you know masts over 70 feet high and they were doing this they were just going back and forth 
and the rigging. So there was no way for the helicopter get, to get anywhere near close enough to take us off the deck. It would be too dangerous. And so we had to jump one at a time into the water. The helicopter would peel off and, and we would just lose them in the dark and go back and find that person and pick them up. And then they would come back and get the next one. When you talk to your fellow crew members um, for this book about that experience, did they describe a similar feeling? Feelings of like qu quiet and stillness? Um, everyone had their own experience and some of it felt so different from mine because I was, I think I was exhilarated in the beginning, um, but I was so, to me, it was just a terrifying experience. And uh, Damien Sailors, for example, described it as, uh, you know, he had seen those, those, those old classic paintings of ships at sea and sailors on, on, on hard seas. And he felt like he was in the middle of that. But he loved it. He was a, a surfer. He was a surfing guy from, from Hawaii. And um, he loved every minute. Peter Abelman loved it. Uh, for them, it was just the most exciting thing. You, know? huh. yeah. you wrote, I would live or I would die, but I would finally do one or the other. It was, not, it was the not knowing that I couldn't take anymore. Has this experience changed how you think about dying? I mean, we're getting um, right into the heavy, the heavy <laughs> stuff. Well, I, you know, I think part of the reason I, I wrote that and I felt that at the time was, you know, I've talked to people since then. Whenever, whenever I bring this up, you know, everyone that I talk to who has had uh, a near-death experience, you know, they want to tell me about it. And, you know, and they're all uh, significant and important. The difference was that we were facing it. You know, I've been in, in car accidents that lasted seconds that th you saw your life flash past you. This was 30 hours, 30 hours of getting to ponder your own mortality, 30 hours of fighting to stay alive. And I, I have to say by the end of the 30 hours, I was, I was just done. I was really, and, and if, if it were for me, um, I would have given up, you know, but it, at a crucial moment, I think when I was, uh, uh, looking at Langdon lying in the bunk, I thought of my parents and they were in Bolivia. I was thinking, okay, you know, right now they're, they're gonna wake up to a, a tropical day. My mother, all she does is think about her children and think about where they are and how are they doing. And they would have no way, they didn't know where I was. They didn't know I had gone on this trip. And so I pictured her finding out that her son had been lost and how she would find that out. And I, you know, in a funny way, I could not allow that to happen. And so that gave me the strength to say, okay, you know, but when it came to the jump, because I was willing to keep fighting as much as I had to, but when I jumped, I knew that it was out of my hands. And it was such a release, you know, to know, okay, I, I am going to live or I'm going to die. It's much less up to me than it has been. It's up to the skill of, of those guys on the helicopter. Let's see if they can do their job. So. They did. That was uh, amazing, the work that they did. And you talk about that in great detail. Um, I will say the one, one other thing was the relief was landing in the water. I thought, you know, I, I was picturing this freezing. We were in the, in the Gulf Stream. So I landed. I went under. I came back up like a little cork. And I said, I can, I can be here as long as I need to. I really felt like calm and confident. And, and I, I just felt like I was waiting for those guys. So. Wow. I just I get this. I, <laughs> yeah. I just have this image of the. Um, the I, I don't know how many of you saw the Perfect Storm, that movie with um, Mark Wahlberg, and that mm -hmm. image as they pull away, that final image of him just like in this tiny little speck on this huge, rolling sea. And I'm thinking, holy cow, you're jumping in the middle of that, but you felt you felt calm. That's yeah. that's yeah. quite amazing. Amy, I hate to say this, but I've, I forgot to plug in <laughs> my computer and I'm getting a low signal. So I'm going to have to run, chat with the audience. I'm going to run, get the, the plug and I'll be back in, in one minute. Okay. Okay. Sorry about that. No, no worries. So while he, he, he gets a power source, um, just a reminder, we've got this, the, the Q&A bubble down there at the bottom to the far right. 
um, jump in at any time with questions. Uh, you don't have to wait until the end. We will definitely set aside 15 minutes at the end for your questions for Nelson. So um, those of you who are friends of his who know this story and are finding out new elements of it, this is your opportunity to say, hey, you never told me about that. Um, those of you who've gone sailing or, or know this sailing world, um, your opportunity to ask questions okay, about that. Okay, we're back, we're back. Oh, and then there he that. is, he's got it. <laughs> All right, I was just telling everybody to jump in with questions um, right. at, at any time. So let's, uh, this wasn't your first hurricane. You experienced no. two others. Uh, hurricane <laughs> Alma well, well, in Three, actually, yeah. Right, I'm forgetting Hurricane Sandy. Um, uh, but no, her Alma, there was, uh, the first one was Alma, the second was Agnes, and the third one was Gloria. Gloria, okay. Yeah. yeah and the then 90s. Grace, so that's four. And then Grace, yes. And then Sandy. That's Sandy fine. later, later on. Yeah, much later. Uh huh. You, you, <laughs> you and hurricanes. There's something going on here. Um, Hurricane Alma, 1966, when you were seven. Mm. At that time, you, your mom and dad, and your brother Rob were living in Maryland, and the four of you drove to Miami for your first family vacation. You write that it was a delicate time that you mm. were trying to become more of a family. What were your family circumstances at that time? Um, when I was two, my mother left us in Bolivia with my grandmother to come to the U.S. to bring her father uh, to Walter Reed, the military hospital in Washington, D.C. My grandfather had been paralyzed uh, and he was a military man. So they were hoping that that they could do something for him because in Bolivia, there was there was just no way they could. And so she, my father, who was a doctor, and my grandfather were living here. So we were, my brother and I were apart from our parents for an entire year uh, before my grandmother brought us to the US. And uh, my mother remembers, she said, uh, when you first saw me, you didn't know who I was. She said, your grandmother was the, the mother you knew. And so those were the circumstances when we drove the 1,065 miles from, from our home to Miami Beach for a family vacation. Um, came down the first morning and they were boarding the, ho the hotel up because there was a hurricane on the way. Yeah. And, and so, so you're in this hotel, the staff is boarding up the windows. They tell you to leave, you just got there. And as your family is driving back, it starts to rain, like really rain. How mm -hmm. did your parents react? Well, we didn't know what a hurricane was. <laughs> so um, we knew it was a big storm, but we had never, you know, Bolivia is a landlocked country. So we had never really experienced that or, or been aware of that. So I, I think, you know, the, the, the memory I have that, that it was, it was very lighthearted. My parents were happy to be together. We were all together and we're driving through this rain. Um, it took us a while to, before we realized that we were the only car on the road. You know, yeah, yeah. And then these lights came up behind us and it was the police car. And the policeman said, you do realize there's a hurricane coming. And my father said, yes, we're driving home. And he just gave a sigh and he said, you've got to get off the road now. There's a, ho a motel six miles up. And so he, he told us to go, go take shelter as quickly as we could. Yeah. So you have a special image of your mom from this trip. You say she has always seemed to live life with a heavy heart, but she was happy driving through this yeah, hurricane. So. What so. do you think made her happy in that moment? I think just being with her boys and her husband and, you know, and having an adventure. I think there was a real way in which we didn't know the danger we were in. So it was just very exciting. And I write that, uh, you know, when Rob and I got restless, she started tell telling us scary stories to calm us down, um, which seems a strange way to, to calm these two boys right. down. But I, I, think, I think that there was something about picturing the, the bad things out there somewhere, you know, uh, that let us feel safe together. Yeah. yeah. Uh, the hurricane caused a lot of damage along the coast and you couldn't go back home the way that you had come and you had to drive state highways and, and county roads mm -hmm. instead. 
and you insisted on stopping at every little southern town cemetery you drove <laughs> past. What was it about small cemeteries? I love Outings. cemeteries too, but you, you write that, that it was, you know, you were attracted to it at seven. Outings for my family would tend to take a long time because if we drove <laughs> past the cemetery, we had to stop. And, you know, I don't know exactly. I think there was the, I think part of it was the scary part was exciting to me. The sort of the spirits were very interesting to me, uh, but also there was a piece which I was very attracted to. And I always looked, you know, in those little, it was either a, a cemetery of, that was part of a church or a family cemetery. And I always looked for the oldest headstones. I wanted to see families that were buried together, people who had, had grown up, lived and died in one place, you know. And I think that that was because of our circumstances that, that to be you know, taken away from everything that I knew at age three. Uh, I think that stayed with me, you know, and I wanted that feeling of, of being rooted in a place. So let's talk about how you ended up as a crew member of the Anna Christina. What got you interested in sailing? <laughs> I'm not sure, but at a certain <laughs> point. <laughs> okay, let me say this. I tell people, I, I, I don't want to do anything. Like I tell people that if it made sense never to get out of bed, like if that was my civic duty, that I would st I'd be the first to sign up. I think that's a little disingenuous because I've, I've lived a life where I've kind of looked for these interesting things to do. And at the time, uh, my friend Peter, who's, who's in the book, not the Peter who ended up on the ship, but uh, my friend Peter from work, he was very interested in sailing. He's the one who discovered Anna Christina. And I was, I really wanted to go on, on Clearwater with him, which is a sloop that sails up and down the Hudson River. And it's a beautiful sloop. It's a, 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 a replica of the sloops from the 19th century. And I ended up uh, volunteering on there for, for a week and Peter couldn't go, so I went by myself. And I just loved it. I loved the, the camaraderie with the other volunteers. I loved singing sea shanties and raising the sails. And, you know, and I write in the book that that was as much excitement as I needed because we were on the river. I could see the shore. Right. That was the best, you know, and um, that really was as much as I needed um, before Peter got me into this, this whole thing. Crazy one, thing. Going to crazy. Bermuda. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So. Um, so you're working at a law firm as a proofreader on the graveyard shift. And I love your description of it and that camaraderie. Um, you describe them as a merry band of nonconformists, artists, actors, musicians. And this is your uh, friend, Peter, not the Peter on the crew. All right, Peter he Hunt Shark. Yeah, he was a friend of the explorer and navigator Norman Baker, the owner of the Anna Christina. He had sailed on the ship. He heard Norman needed people to sail her from Brooklyn to Bermuda. Peter asked you if you'd be interested. The, you Describe to me that process. That seems <laughs> well, a little out of the blue. Okay, like, so, hey, there's a ship. Do you want to come? Well, this seems so casual. Is that how I, people I was sitting at home. <laughs> well, first of all, let, let me back up. Um, we had been invited to a talk that Norman Baker was giving. Uh, and by the, the way, Peter, Peter's on, on, on line with us here. Peter's on right now, I think. Yeah. There he is. Yeah. <laughs> okay. His computer went down. Too. <laughs> um, so our friend Johnny Rosenblatt was very close to the family. And he told us that Norman Baker, who was a world famous explorer, was giving a talk at the Museum of Natural History. Uh, Norman had been on the, the raft uh, the, the Ra expeditions with the exploratory hair doll. I mean, he was a, a famous, famous adventurer and explorer. So he's the owner of the ship. So Peter calls me up that afternoon and says, Norman is looking for people. You know, they're desperate for people. They'll just take hands. And that's when, you know, my heart fell because I was like, oh God, you know, don't, don't do this to me. So we got to the museum, we're waiting to go in and I see Peter walking along and he's just crestfallen. And I go down and just 
quietly, privately say, what's going on? He said, oh, they don't need anybody. You know, they've got a whole crew. I'm like, oh my God, you know. So then now, now that I knew we weren't going to go, then I was just, you know, I said, Peter, we would have been oh, magnificent. Shucks. Yeah. Oh, man. Oh. So we get inside the museum and I'm feeling cocky and good. And Mary Ann Baker, Norman's wife, who's just a, a gracious, lovely woman uh, and wants to include everyone. She comes up and she says, what are you boys doing for the next couple of weeks? We said, working, you know, cause I was with my, my, my workmates, Peter, Mike, Johnny. And uh, she said, no, 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 come with us, come with us. So she invited everybody. And Peter jumped on it, our friend Mike, they're all gung-ho. Johnny, Johnny Rosenblatt was the only one that said no. And, uh, and I asked him later, I said, Johnny, how could you pass that up? And he said, I just didn't want to go. And that to me was phenomenal. I just couldn't believe that it was that easy for him because I just, I couldn't say no. Right, you, um, gosh, and... I have this here somewhere in, in, in my notes. There's a line mm -hmm. that you wrote that just really stuck with me. You write, um, I knew that I was supposed to want to go. Right. And so I would go. Right. So it, it, this, this feeling that there was this expectation or living into other expectations, well, uh, others' expectations yeah, or I mean, something. I, Tell me more I, about that line. I, I've tried to understand you know, both my, the arc of my life and, and this specific incident, but thinking back to when I was young, when I think back to coming to this country as, a, as an immigrant in the early 60s, and we just wanted to fit in. We didn't want to be noticed. We didn't want to, you know, and so I became very, very good at, I was very adept at reading people and making sure that I kept them on my side that I kept them satisfied. You know, it got to the point, like I can, I can read someone and if what I'm saying is displeasing to them, I could read it on their face and I can make very minute adjustments to it. And I can see them, you know, I, I can see sa things are safe again. And so that was the feeling that I, I just wanted to, um, I wanted to go along with things. You know, um, there's a, an incident on, on the book I write about in college where uh, we were at Lake Norman. I went to Davidson College in North Carolina and Norman is the largest man-made lake in North Carolina. We went there to go swimming and people were, were go going up a tree and grabbing a rope and going down and splashing in the water. Water and I have never gotten along, <laughs> but I was 22 and I, I couldn't say no. Someone said, you wanna try it? I said, yeah, yeah, sure. <laughs> Um, and I nearly drowned, you know, I got in the water. I thought I could bring the line back, but I couldn't. And Amy, I must've been, I was probably 30 feet from shore. I was probably 15 feet from where my feet could touch, but it didn't matter at that point. I was just so panicked and I nearly went down, but I couldn't say no. And mm -hmm. so there was kind of this pattern of getting myself in, into things like this. Tell me about Norman Baker. I didn't know anything about him until I read your book. Um, and did you know anything about him when Peter suggested you help sail his boat, the Anna? I, I didn't remember Norman. I was, as a kid, I was a, a huge fan of, of the Ra expeditions, which were these um, reed boat expeditions. Thor Heyerdahl was this very famous Norwegian explorer. And he had this theory that you know, he saw so many similarities between the, um, the cultures of, of Egypt and that part of the world and the Americas. And he had this, this idea that maybe they had sailed across somehow. And so he, he built these reed boats uh, uh, in Egypt to try to sail across the ocean, uh, Ra 1 and then Ra 2. And Norman was his navigator on both of those. So he was just, and he had a whole history of exploration and sailing and so a, a remarkable just a remarkable man you know yeah he he definitely was and he had this lifelong passion to sail around the world you interviewed him for the book did he explain to you why that was so important to him from the time he was 13 he told me he was a kid he grew up here in in brooklyn and he would he would ride down to uh 
uh, to the docks and watch the, he said, I, I would watch the, the ships sail and, and, you know, to the horizon and then slowly lower down and disappear. And he said, I just knew that I was going to do that. He's just said, I knew I would, I would sail to, to my heart's desire. You know, as a 13 year old, he knew this. So, you know, go figure a 13 year old, they have their own logic, right. but he just knew. Um, right. And he did everything. He, you know, he learned, he actually learned how to fly a plane at 13. He soloed at 17. Um, you know, he was a gold miner, um, surveyor, you know, just, he, he, he punched a shark. You, know, you hear that joke about punching a shark to get away. <laughs> so he actually did that once to survive. Wow. And faced, uh, faced death more, more than once on ships and, and, and the plane and you know, many, other, many other things. But he did tell me, I asked him once, are you an adventurer? And he said, well, if by an adventurer, you mean someone who just looks for thrills, uh, for, for the thrill itself, he said, no. He said uh, he had two, two things. He wanted to experience these adventures, these experiences, but it had to have a higher calling, a higher cause. Um, and so he, he did not take unnecessary risks. You know, he took big risks. You know, at the time I found him, when I tracked down Norman, he was 88. And um, it took a while to track him down. And he wrote back to me. And uh, he said, I'm sorry, it took me so long to get back to you. I was out horseback riding in my my horse refused to take the last jump <laughs> and he was 88 and, you know, he was still skiing. He broke his leg skiing and the whole bit. Norman just could not, he couldn't not do this stuff. So his, his passion to sail around the world drove him to buy this ship, the Anna Christina. He found out that it was rotten. They basically, he, Marianne and his kids totally rebuilt that ship. Yeah. Um, can you tell me just a, just give me a little snapshot because that is a family that was totally oriented around this man's obsession with getting this ship into shape, ship shape, and and taking the family around the sailing around the world. Well, I'll say I I, I do think for starters, Norman found the exact right mate in Marianne. Um, she hadn't experienced those kinds of adventures that he had by the time he met her, but she was very interested. She really wanted to sail with him and it became her dream too. And, um, and she really complimented Norman. Uh, their son Mitchell told me that uh, Norman could hang out with explorers of the world, you know, the, the weird driven people. Um, you know, he was, he was kind of awkward socially, but Mary Ann, could hang out with everybody else. And so she really was just this generous, uh, you know, she, she completed Norman in so many ways. And I think other than that, you know, their, their oldest son, Dan, Dan seemed to have the same passion when I talked to him. Uh, he was as driven as Norman. He wanted to sail around the world from the time he was eight years old. He wanted to sail with his dad. And then the, the, the two younger kids, Elizabeth and Mitchell, I mean, they wanted to, I, I got the feeling they got swept up in it, you know, um, mm -hmm. and so that they were, um, they didn't want to be on that island. So they found the, the ship on Tortola. Norman moved the entire family down there because the owner had told him three months tops, you'll be sailing. And, um, and so <laughs> the joke became that they were always 90 days away from sailing. And that lasted four years and all their money. Uh, they sold their house. I mean, this was one of the great obsessions. Um, yeah. yeah. So how did he react? Uh, he pours his life savings and everything into this ship. Love this ship. How did he react when he learned that the ship went down? That when, once you, when your crew was rescued, that meant that the ship was lost. I, I think at first it was disbelief, I, I, because I think he and, and Marianne assumed, uh, because he, he told me later that they were, they were tracking the course of the ship that in their minds, you know, that they figured, okay, once the storm starts, they're going to take shelter 
um, maybe in the Chesapeake Bay or you know somewhere along there. Um, and so it was just shock. And one of the, the, the scenes from the book is when we, we finally get back to the, uh, the Coast Guard station uh, in Elizabeth City. Um, and um, we are, they give us a phone and we actually called the, the, the Bakers and Norman came on and Marianne came on. And Joey said to him, we made it, we're on shore. And Norman said, oh, oh okay, where's, where's Anna Christina? And Joey said, we're on shore. And uh, where's Anna Christina? You know, and they did this about three times and Joey could never tell him. He couldn't get the words out, mm. you know? And it was just devastating. It was one of the worst moments, I think, for all of us to stand there and, and have to, to tell these people that we'd lost their ship. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm cognizant of the time, but I do want to okay. get to this point. Uh, we have two more minutes and I want to open it up to some questions. Um, okay. Three months after your rescue during Hurricane Grace, the Bakers write to you and the other members of the crew to tell you they'd been hearing rumors that Anna Christina had come apart and that she was abandoned for reasons of unseaworthiness. They wrote to defend the ship to say that it wasn't true, that the ship's fate was because the crew wasn't familiar with the ship. What did you think when you opened that letter? I was shocked because it was the first I was hearing of it. And um, apparently in the, in the sort of sailing community, the stuff had been flying around. And so it was months before, it had been flying around months before I you know, read their letter and it's the first I was hearing of it. So I was really, really surprised. I mean, in my, you know, in, in my reality, we had done the best we could. Uh, the ship had done, you know, had kept us and done all that she could and the Coast Guard had gone above and beyond, you know, that there were, there were no villains here. Um, so it was really, it was, it was heartbreaking for me. I, I, I realized, you know, for the Bakers, it was bad enough to have lost their ship. And then to have to suffer through this on top of it was, just seemed unfair to me. Before it was your turn to jump into the ocean, um, there was a moment when Marty, Peter and Joey talked about trying to save the ship. Yeah. Marty said, we can still do this, Joe. And you write, hearing this, I felt like raising my hand that they'd forgotten that I was still on board. <laughs> do you think the ship could have been saved? Uh, not at that point. I don't think so. I, I think because she was filling. Much water? Uh -huh. She was filling. And they were too far off, uh, off the coast. So, you know, at that point, you're, you're either riding out the storm. You know, I think if she hadn't been filling, but I, I think that, you know, that was another controversy is why was she filling? And, and I, I think it's because we had left things open, the water was coming in from above because there was some suggestion that she had popped a plank or that the leaking was come, happening from below. And, you know, the, nor the, the, the bakers pointed out to us and, you know, I, I since have checked with other captains and experts, if you, if you pop a plank, yeah. In conditions like that, it's not a slow leak. You no. you'll have a geyser coming up through yeah. the bottom of that ship. So, all right, some questions. How uh, okay. from Crystal Harris? How did this experience change your relationship to the water? Um, oddly enough, uh, I went sailing again. I was invited to go sailing. Langdon, one of the crew members, called me up and said, "There's another ship going out." For a much less ambitious trip, but it was another tall ship, an old tall ship, uh, and and I went. Uh, you know, I I um, I love sailing, and and uh, I I if if there are any sailing folks with sailing boats out there, call me up because uh, you know I'll I'll go. Part of it is too that I, I also mentioned that once you've been through this, uh, you're considered a good luck charm among sailors, so they they love to have you aboard. Uh, Jeff from Cleveland Heights writes, when you jumped in the water, were you wearing a PFD and were you a good swimmer? How tough was it to swim before you had to climb into the basket too, right? Right. You, you so, had to haul yourself in. Yeah. Well, what happened was, so they, on, on the a Coast Guard helicopter, there's the pilot, the co-pilot, 
um, the guy who operates the winch to up lower and, and raise the basket and the swimmer. So the swimmer made it through two people and then he got so sick, they wouldn't let him go back in um, because he was helping us into the basket. So the, the Lang, uh, Langdon went first and then the two women, I was the fourth one. So after two people, they saw that we were handling ourselves well. And so they would just lower the basket. I was wearing a uh, yeah, life vest. Uh, I had a little light and a whistle. Um, and I wasn't swimming. I mean, <laughs> I mean, I, I, not any kind bobbing. of swimming. But I was, thank you. I was bobbing. I was bobbing. Yes. Um, let's see. When did your parents find out what had happened? <laughs> um, so once I... Your abuela didn't tell them? Yeah, she, she knew did. you came. Oh, okay. no, she did. Because I went home to Maryland. I didn't want to go back to Brooklyn and be alone. So I, I actually, uh, from uh, Virginia, I flew back to to our home in Maryland, and I just collapsed. So my my abuela was there, my grandmother, and I'm sure she called them and let them know that they're, you know. So what was their your dear son was <laughs> up to his his old tricks. <laughs> What, what was your conversation with your parents like when you, like, hi, mom, hi, dad? Yeah, I don't remember. Like, my parents, I, I have them pretty well trained. I have them pretty well trained by that point. <laughs> so they, they kind of didn't mess with me. Yeah. Uh, Linda Hardwick. And I, and I think asked, they felt bad for me because I was in such bad shape. Too. Yeah. So Li Linda Hardwick asks, how did you process what happened? And how long did it take for you to get back to some kind of normalcy um normalcy is debat <laughs> debatable uh, yeah are you back there yet yeah right i was telling the story constantly so some of the the crew members that i finally got to talk to they they didn't never wanted to talk about it again that's how they dealt with it i couldn't stop talking about it you know i just felt like that was part of the process and my friends wanted to hear it and and some of them heard it so many times they were actually correcting me when I got a point wrong, because they, they knew the story better than I did. So I would say, I mean, I would say it took months or, or years before I, I kind of felt myself, you know, yeah. Uh, Alexander asks, how did you find the process of transferring that, because you've performed this, how did yes. you find the process of transferring this oral history into written form? Um, I had to find the story. I had to find the, the backstory because when my friend Virginia said, you should write a book. And I said, just leave me alone. And she wouldn't, she wouldn't give up. She kept bugging me. So she introduced me to Stacy, who uh, became my agent. And, um, you know, and I said to her, the, it was four days. How am I going to write a book about four days? Uh, and so I had to go back. And so in the book, I tell more of my story. I tell Norman's story. I tell the, the story of Anna Christina. Uh, so it was, to me, it was a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful process. I really loved doing the research and delving into things. And um, yeah. Well, I want to ask you about that for, for people who are writers here on this, uh, this uh, event and are writing their own memoir. Um, you interviewed Norman, you interviewed all the crew members, except two, right. um, Marty Hanks, whom you couldn't locate, and Jen Irving, who didn't want to talk. Mm -hmm. um, what did you want from them? Did you ask each of them to walk through that day? Were you hoping that you, you could, cre you know, yeah. fill in the blanks from your yeah. memory? Basically, uh, I, wanted, I wanted their experience. I wanted as much as possible to get as much of this experience, as much of the experience we all had together. Because remember, although I was on deck in the beginning, there, were, there was a long stretch that I was below deck. And so I wanted to find out, well, what was it in, in, at the worst of it? What were you going through? Um, so, you know, I heard some pretty harrowing stories from, from those guys about what they were. And they were trying to keep, the, because some of the pumps uh, were not primed properly, they weren't working properly. And so Marty Hanks was basically, we had a small uh, gasoline powered pump on deck and, you know, her in 75 to hundred mile an hour winds, he's trying to 
keep it running. And, you know, they finally, they had to fill the, the tank below deck because the, the wind wouldn't let them, you know, would sweep off the, the gasoline. So then the entire below deck is reeking of gasoline. We're all nauseous. I mean, it was just, it was horrendous, let me tell you. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, it was. <laughs> uh, what tips do you have for people who may want to interview family members or friends for their memoirs? Oh, that's a great question. <sighs> Stacy writes, it was so bad, it was book worthy. Love it. <laughs> Thank you, Stacy. Thank you, Stacy. <laughs> um, I, I would say to, to uh, expect. To, to do more than one interview, like to, to sort of work them up, you know, uh, and to feel like you really just, ha you have to get people talking. And a lot of these interviews I did were, you know, three and four hours long, because I would just talk about things I knew were not really pertinent, but I wanted them to, you, you, you have to, you have to honor them, you know, have to, they need to feel respected and, and listened to. And then you can slowly work them in. You know, I interviewed Norman for six hours over two days um, and got him talking. My one regret now, because I went to their home in the late 90s, this was a little bit after the experience to interview Norman. And I didn't interview Marianne at the time, which I think I really re regret not having done that at the time. You know, because she would have told another, a whole different story or her story. Right. Yeah. Um, this is from David. Was there no information known to the expedition leaders at the start that they would be sailing into a storm or was this storm entirely unpredicted? This was the question that I asked again and again and again, like, why, why, why did we do this? And uh, part of it, I think, was um, in practical terms, the end of, you're dealing with two things. You're dealing with hurricanes from the south and with the nor'easters, the, the northern storms from the north. And if you remember, if you know about the, the perfect storm that Sebastian Younger wrote about in his book, The Perfect Storm, you had the hurricane from the south, you had the nor'easter from the north, and you had the storms coming off the Great Lakes from the west. And it, they came together in what he called a perfect storm perfect because it could be no worse. Hmm. And so when I talked to Norman about that, he said, you know, the, the, the saying in sailing terms is by October, it's over. And so they felt safe uh, in terms of hurricanes, it's over, sailing south. If they had waited any longer, the northern storms would have started. And so it looked like a window, like a perfect window. And, um, you know, obviously it, it wasn't because we got the hurricane and we got the nor nor'easter from the north. Um, and the other thing was, to note, I'm sorry, go ahead. Well, that was, you know, when, when you think about Norman and Joey, two such experienced sailors, like, why did you do this? So I knew they had good reason. They felt it was safe. I mean, they, mm -hmm. you know, I think it was a one in a thousand. And that's what we got. We got the one, one in a thousand. What I was also going to note, though, was Joey was also, what, 26 years old? He was 27 at the time. 27, yeah. 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 So was young. his first command. All right. yeah. He was very confident, though. It was interesting talking to him at the time, but also 30 years later. And, um, and he, you know, he admitted he was a cocky kid. He, he, thought, he said to me, uh, all I need is enough hands, and I can sail this thing. So, but just to, to uh, I'm sorry, just to... To contrast that with another ship yes. that actually made it, the Ernestina was a ship that sailed almost the same route, um, but they had 35 people on board. They had 25 sailing students. They had a professional crew. They had an engineer on the pumps. You know, we had nine people, some of whom didn't know anything. And so you know, that, was, that was a big difference. So does it, um, Owen asks, does anyone know exactly where the Anna Christina is now? Did Norman oh, ever want to try no. and oh, raise it or find it? Oh my it? God, yes, yes, yes. Like he, uh, he took a trip down to the, the Coast Guard. He interviewed everyone. He talked to the crew members. He talked to the Coast Guard rescuers and the Coast Guard 
radio operators, he went down there and uh, they said to him, you know, with the ocean currents, there are thousands and thousands of ships down there, you know, all through time. Ever since we started traversing the ocean, you know, they're all down there. You can't find them. It's too, it's too big. You know. um, what, Brenda asks, what was the most difficult part of writing this book and how did you overcome it? Um, I think the hardest part was believing that I could. And so I really didn't believe I could till halfway through the writing. I mean, the, I know how to research, um, but the, the writing was, and so I have to say, you know, I started writing in May of 2020. So I wrote in lockdown and um, as horrible as the pandemic has been and, and how hard the lockdown was, I couldn't go anywhere. I couldn't see anyone. I had to get up and write every day. And uh, I had a word count every day because I wrote from, I've, I wrote the entire book from May to November. I was done. And so I knew exactly how, how many long, words. That's how long it's taken me to do a five minute story, man, for <laughs> WCPN. Holy cow. Okay. So boom, done. Um, <laughs> well, and I, and I love it. It takes a lockdown to get you to the desk and, the, right. and the, to, the hardest part of writing is writing. It's just sitting down writing. It feels the, it feels the best when you're done, doesn't right. it? Yeah. So I do um, want to say before, before you go on, because I, I promised Kay that I would, that uh, yeah. uh, please, if you haven't bought this book and you want to, buy it from Greenlight Bookstore. I love them. They're one of the great independent bookstores in Brooklyn, anywhere. And they have been so gracious to do this with us. So uh, we need to support them. So buy it from Greenlight. Yes, please. A shout out to Greenlight, um, yeah. my favorite bookstore when I was in um, living in uh, Clinton Hill, Fort Greene. Yeah. One last one. And I think this, you, two people have asked this. Who would you like to play in the, to oh, play God. you in the movie adaptation? All right. So I was 32 at the time. I don't know. Okay. Uh, send us your suggestions. Yes. How about that? Is Ryan Gosling too old? How old is he now? Ryan Gosling, I think that'd be great. Yeah. <laughs> All right. It is 830. That is a wrap. Thank you, okay. everybody, Thank for you. your vigorous participation. I love the questions. Um, Nelson, Thanks, it's everybody. a really great book. I learned a lot about hurricanes. I've learned a lot about Norman Baker. Mm. Um, hats off to him. Um, uh, may he rest in peace. And um, great job. Really, really great job. And it's I, really I do have to, story. I have to say to everyone, uh, you know, I've, I've known Amy for a while when she was here in New York, she was my tennis buddy. Um, you were my dream for this, Amy, as soon as I found out that Greenlight was going to let us do this, uh, you were my dream interviewer. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, an honor and a pleasure. Thank you, everybody. Uh, I want to say uh, thanks to Kay uh, Karamian, who was our MC for the evening, to Jean Yoon and Ben Hoffman at Greenlight. Thank you so very, very much. Have a wonderful evening. We just have a rapid dismount. This is it. So thank you for joining <laughs> us. You. And um, we'll thanks, see you on the Kay. other side. Take thank care. Thank you all Take so care, much. Everybody. This was a great event. Look out for it on YouTube. All right. We'll see you soon. Thank you. Bye, all.